You're listening to ReachMD XM 157 and Dr. Nancy Nielsen, the incoming president of the American Medical Association, during her inauguration at the 2008 House of Delegates meeting held in Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, the 163rd president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Nancy H. Nielsen. Ladies and gentlemen, there are, are many talented physicians who could occupy this office and have done so. You have heard recent AMA presidents call on us to never, never give up, to light the way for health insurance for all, to remain committed to true north, and to restore leadership and responsibility to our profession. Last year, you heard a call for commitment to public health from a man who did not know that all too soon making his own health public would be an act of courage and inspiration for us all. Ron, I thank you for reminding all of us of the power that hope provides. I know this office is not about any individual's accomplishments. It's about the opportunity we physicians have to be leaders in a very exciting time. It's certainly exciting politically. It's challenging economically. And it's demanding scientifically. But there's another excitement right now, and that's our opportunity to build a new and better healthcare system in America. Cynics say we don't have a healthcare system. They say we take care of sickness more than we preserve health. They say it's anything but a system. And they say that care is the quality that patients are looking for but often fail to receive. I have a response to the critics, and it may not be one they would expect. And maybe you, too, will be surprised. But it's one I firmly believe we must embrace. Today, right now, we have the opportunity to form linkages, to break log jams that have frustrated us for decades, to resolve differences that have come between us and our patients today. Right now, we have the opportunity to forge connections that can resolve disputes, that can decide issues, that could put the focus where it should be and where it absolutely has to be on our patients and on the strength and fortitude of our profession. All of this may involve us in a new type of engagement with traditional adversaries. But this is not conciliation. This is not capitulation. It's civil engineering. I want you to think for a moment about bridges, all kinds of bridges. Close your eyes and picture the Golden Gate Bridge the Brooklyn Bridge, a covered bridge in rural America, the Ponte Vecchio, London Bridge, or the Michigan Avenue Bridge just outside this hotel. All of them have one thing in common. They bridge from here to there, across a gap or over an obstacle. They also represent human greatness and ingenuity because at some point in time, there was no bridge there, only the chasm, the river, or the obstacle. Then someone or some group got tired of the obstruction and came together, took the initiative, and built a bridge. In America, there are more than half a million bridges. We rely on them every day to cross streams and railroad tracks and valleys, all sorts of obstacles. We are also mindful of the terrible tragedy when a bridge collapses and of the folly of expending resources on a bridge to nowhere. My friend Tom Sanders is a civil engineer, and he taught me some things about bridges. There are only a few basic types. The difference between them is how they deal with two important forces, compression and tension. There's the beam bridge, just a horizontal beam supported at each end by piers. The weight of the beam and anything on it pushes straight down on the piers. The farther apart the piers, the weaker the beam becomes. And that's why beam bridges rarely span more than 250 feet. 
Then there are arch bridges, which have great natural strength. In Roman times, they were made of stone, and today they're made of steel. And there are graceful suspension bridges where the roadway hangs from massive steel cables draped over tall towers. The cables are really just lots and lots of, of individual wires, strands of wires bundled together to capture the force, carry the load, and deliver it to the support columns. And these are the bridges which are used to span the widest gaps. Now, I'm convinced there's an important analogy between bridges that distribute powerful forces, withstand high winds and stormy weather, and provide safe passage across a chasm on the one hand, and our opportunity to change the American healthcare system on the other. Think about the chasm in healthcare. Not just the quality chasm so well described in the IOM report, but other gaps that divide us as a country and keep us from fulfilling our AMA vision of advancing the art and science of medicine and the betterment of the public health. Now, you can look at those gaps from a variety of points of view. Physicians see many obstacles. We work harder and harder, but we face reimbursements that are flat or worse while our practice costs continue to go up. We're forced to spend less time with our patients, but patients increasingly have complex conditions and concerns. Information explosion and advances in technology challenge all of us to keep up our knowledge and skills. We came to medicine to care, to cure, and to comfort, but these values are often not reflected in payment systems. Then there's the patient view. Patients, by and large, like their doctors. They trust us but they see healthcare as a vast chasm of uncoordinated, uncaring, complex parts that ignore their basic wants and needs. Meanwhile, insurers see their own set of obstacles. They complain about physicians who churn patients and maximize income with tests and procedures. They blame others who they say don't keep up and who resist efforts to improve quality, all in the name of preserving autonomy. The nation's largest insurer, the government, sees its own set of chasms, fee-for-service rewarding quantity but not quality, enormous inconsistency from one region to another, variabilities that seem to correlate more with the number of physicians than with patient needs. And they look at the demographics and the projections, and they warn us Medicare is going bankrupt, maybe sooner than later. Is it any wonder that these differing views of the obstacles we face got us where we are today, to an environment where we see anger and mistrust, inflamed rhetoric, and finger pointing? Today, physicians stand like surveyors at the edge of a very large chasm in healthcare, facing a challenging, sometimes hostile environment. So, what do we do? Do we fight? Do we storm the barricades? Do we hunker down? Do we dig a moat around us? Or should we despair? Well, Henry Kissinger once said, the statesman's duty is to bridge the gap between experience and vision. So why not turn the problem into an opportunity? Why not take up tools to build a signature bridge for America over the healthcare chasm? Why not start weaving wires into cables, join with patients, employers, and maybe even insurers to build a bridge to a better future where the real enemies are not each other, but disease, despair, and untimely death? Each strand in a bundled cable has to be strong, and each strand has to be accountable. Accountable not only for its own strength and its own integrity, but to the paramount responsibility, the health of our patients. And we may need many bridges of differing shapes, depending on the obstacle to be overcome. One major obstacle is the lack of affordable health insurance options for 47 million Americans. There was a time in the lifetime of many of us in this room when insurance wasn't necessary and wasn't even available. 
My mother had no insurance when my sister and I were born and when my father had his first heart attack, but those days are over. Even physicians who choose concierge care or participate in no insurance plans recognize that their patients need insurance for situations that are so expensive that cash reserves simply won't come close for the vast majority of us, whether it's a hospitalization, a surgery, biotech drugs, a catastrophic illness, or a devastating chronic illness. It is unconscionable that we, the richest nation in the world, have 47 million people uninsured through benign neglect. It is unconscionable that thousands of patients die each year because they delay care until it's too late. So in my year as president, I will use all the power of this office, of this association, to give a voice to those patients, to let the nation know that we must cover America's uninsured. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to ReachMD XM 157 and Dr. Nancy Nielsen, the incoming president of the AMA, during her inauguration at the 2008 House of Delegates meeting. Calling attention to the problem is simply not enough. It's time to design and build a solution and figure out how to pay for it. We claim to have an employer-based insurance system, but two out of five employers don't even offer health insurance. We have world-class science, but the delivery mechanism is so expensive that health care costs actually threaten our global competitiveness, and medical expenses remain the number one cause of bankruptcy. And too much current rhetoric ignores the heart-wrenching realities you and I face every day. I was recently in Florida about to speak to the economic club. As often happens when I'm on the road, I met a woman who wanted to tell me her story. She was a general manager of the hotel where I was staying. A good job. She told me that her current employer covered all the costs of her health care for all the employees. That's a great plan. But her previous employer didn't even offer health insurance. So she purchased an individual health policy for six months as she prepared to relocate to Florida to work. The transition to the new job took a little longer, so she renewed the policy for another six months, and one week later, she found a breast lump. The insurance company refused to pay, claiming a pre-existing condition, despite a normal mammogram a year before and a normal breast exam three months before. When I met her over four years later, she was paying off the last $5,000 of the $50,000 bill for breast cancer treatment. Now, who in this room cannot empathize with that woman and with millions like her across America? She did everything right, and yet the system failed her. She fell in that deep chasm and is working herself to the bone to drag herself out. Stories like that take the care out of health care. It's time to recognize that each of us should be able to purchase affordable health insurance, not be pawns of an employer's choices. Insurance that won't end when a job ends. Americans deserve choice in addition to access, and they certainly don't have that now. If we were to work with insurers, if we were to show employers the way, we can construct a bridge for all Americans to cross. Instead of lurching inevitably toward government control in the current poisonous partisan atmosphere, we could craft all sorts of choices. But we must work together to build that bridge with the goals of coverage and choice combined with care and compassion. Regardless of our political leanings, we cannot, simply cannot, 
allow the problem of the uninsured to grow ever larger. To do so in this time of economic downturn would be a national tragedy. So let us lay down arms, take up tools, and build a bridge. Not a pork barrel bridge to nowhere. Our bridge has to go somewhere very important. We can and we will work with others if they participate in good faith. But we cannot use inferior materials because doing that invites a bridge collapse and lives will be lost. We will insist that the materials are forged in science, in educational training, in ethics, and in professionalism. We're going to differ on the tactics, but the goal has to be clear. We're going to differ on details, but we have to accept shared responsibility to do what's right, what's ethical, and what's necessary. Each of us is an important strand in one cable. But we cannot be the only cable. Each part of the healthcare system, indeed every American, must bear part of the weight, share the burden, and distribute the force. If the bridge is to be safe and strong and sturdy, we need to craft a sustainable solution that can withstand high winds and stormy weather. We can't do it alone. Insurance executives, health plan policymakers, economists, they all have an important role to play, but they cannot craft a workable solution without patient input and without the help of physicians. I say to you and I say to them that this bridge cannot be built without the leadership of physicians. So let me lay out some challenges for insurers and physicians and, and the government. For insurers, instead of issuing that report card on what percent of my patients didn't get a mammogram, tell me the names of those patients so I can verify the data and reach out to each one and offer a test that could save a life. Help me find out if my patient filled the script that I wrote. Help me learn if my patient is refilling his meds in a way that shows he's taking them reliably and consistently. And find out if your health plan's copay is so high that it is the real barrier to control of her diabetes, her hyperlipidemia, her congestive heart failure. And stop referring to medical loss ratio to be ratcheted down and refocus on patient needs because that's how premium dollars should be used. Not on exorbitant CEO salaries, not on soaring administrative costs, and not on shareholder dividends. <laughs> Forget about lopping off physicians and steering patients into tiered and narrow networks. Stop issuing faulty report cards based on flawed data, but instead turn around and help us. Harness the available technology to feed information both to physicians and to patients. In you insurers already reach out to patients. It's your, in your best interest anyway because HEDIS data are reported publicly. So there are shared interests for us all. Now to be fair, some health plans have been innovative and collaborative but it is time for all of them to be so. And what about physicians? To our colleagues, I say, first, let's agree to lead. Let's come together to agree on national health care goals and a timetable to reach them. Then the bridge building can begin. Let us demand comparative effectiveness trials that will generate scientific evidence so we can help patients make the best choices for their situation using all the knowledge of genomics, drug discovery and design, and therapeutics. We know that costs are important and we bear a responsibility to be concerned about that. But let's reframe that issue into determining what is appropriate and effective in a given situation. Our specialty societies are the absolute key to that work. Look what cardiologists and radiologists did when payers balked at the number of imaging studies being ordered. 
these two specialties sat down separately and then together and built a bridge that began with patient need and worked back to deciding when and if a test was appropriate. They developed and published appropriateness criteria for cardiac imaging and saved money in the process. I say we need more of that kind of bridge building. And I say further, if we don't, someone else will make those decisions, and we won't like that at all. We're being asked to be accountable. We should proudly accept that challenge. We physicians live and breathe accountability. It is woven into our profession and into every patient encounter, whether that's in a clinic, an operating room, or an office. We are accountable to our patients, to their families, to each other. Now let's show health plans, government, and our patients that how we can weave that accountability into strong, safe cables for the healthcare bridge. Finally, to government officials I say, it's really important that you get out of the way Let innovations in healthcare delivery and in health insurance flourish. In the great wars of our fathers and grandfathers, the Army developed portable bridges, pontoon bridges, and other practical solutions to win the war. Let's use our American ingenuity to do what Clint Eastwood called improvise, adapt, and overcome. Let's say to policymakers, whether they're in Washington, D.C., Albany, or your state capital, do not demoralize dedicated physicians by demeaning them and denigrating their motives. Do not chart the transformation of healthcare by crunching numbers behind closed doors because every number is a patient who is sick or frightened or confused. And do not design healthcare bridges without physicians. It is doctors and their patients who have to cross those bridges every day. We are the ones who bear the responsibility and have the enormous privilege to care for our patients. We've always been willing to adapt, but we will not compromise the integrity of our profession. So it's time to decide. Do we dig another moat, or do we build a bridge? You and I can take the lead, we can take the initiative, we can take our patient's well-being as a starting point, and we can start to take action. If our efforts at cooperation with others fail, we can still employ the traditional methods of redress, litigation, regulation, or refusing to participate in schemes that demean us. We will no doubt continue to have struggles and strong differences with our traditional adversaries. But bridging some obstacles is in everyone's interest. So to make rapid progress while we await a, a new president and a new Congress, let's come together with others to figure out how much innovation can be undertaken quickly without legislation. And I'll be the first to tell you that this won't be easy and it's not without risk. But physicians work with risk every day. There's a reason why patients put their lives in our hands. Every day in this country, there are heroes. When a family physician says to a woman, do you feel safe at home? When a surgeon says to his patient, here's my number, call me if anything isn't going the way you think it should. When an obstetrician says after an ultrasound, I need to tell you something we have to face together when a pediatrician holds the hand of a sick child with no hair. This is the best of our humanity and of our profession. We can use that commitment, courage, and compassion to come together with patients, employers, and insurers to build a signature bridge that provides safe passage across the healthcare chasm. Let's step forward and lead and design that bridge. Now is the time. 
we can build it strong and beautiful and with devotion. We know the problems better than anyone. And we must be the civil engineers who design the solutions. So I say to employers, insurers, Congress, and to both presidential candidates, come help physicians build America's signature bridge. Now is the time, not soon, not someday. The time is now. Thank you. You've been listening to ReachMD XM 157 and Dr. Nancy Nielsen, the incoming president of the American Medical Association, during her inauguration at the 2008 House of Delegates meeting held in Chicago. 